Hey guys, welcome back. My name's Sandy. This is Sawing with Sandy. I'm standing here in the middle of the woods again today where I'm sort of taking in the sights after this brief little snowfall. If we have a look around here, I certainly have some snow to clear and I like to keep a bit of a laneway in here open and I like to keep that laneway open and well that's uh, all to come. But for today, we're in here at the sawmill where I'm going to pick up where we left off last time, take care of some of these balsam fir logs which are now pretty much caked on in snow. But we're going to take care of those today and we're going to continue adding to this lumber pile. Last day I was talking a little bit about my setup. If you want to see that video, be sure to go back and check that out. I have some preferences in terms of buildings, layouts, etc. In that video I talked about it. Today we're going to add to the lumber pile and hopefully, before we're all done, I will convince you guys why just about anybody can saw lumber. This is definitely not rocket science out here and despite what anyone tells you, I was not born knowing how to run a sawmill. Either was anyone else. I'm gonna show you guys that it's just as easy as I suggest it is getting logs up made into lumber with just a little bit of know-how. So let's just say you guys are brand new to sawing. How does the entire process work? Well, it goes like this. You need a sawmill to start with. I run this thing, which is the Woodland Mills HM130 Max. There's all kinds of other brands and models and all kinds of extra things you can have on your sawmill out there, but you need a sawmill. Then you need some logs. You could get your logs like I do from your property, maybe a neighbor's, a friend's, or you could buy your logs. Then the logs need to make their way up here onto the sawmill, and then you've got a choice to make. How are you going to saw those logs? So if you're like me, you may end up trying to cut all four sides off the log right off the start. And so what I do, I get the log up here, I cut the top off, I rotate it, cut the side, rotate it, cut the bottom, rotate it, cut the side. I'm left with four pieces of slab wood, which is waste wood. This right here is slab wood. And if you're uh, like me, you may have a hard time dealing with this from time to time and it gets away from you and piles up. I got to take care of that soon. Anyways, you end up with four pieces of slab wood that you need to deal with as waste. What you then have is what I like to call a cant. A cant is like a big piece of lumber without bark on it. That big piece of lumber gets cut up into smaller pieces of lumber, sort of like this stuff. Now I cut it up into sizes that I'll call dimensional lumber. So at two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, one by four, one by six, one by eight, etc., etc. That's the type of lumber I make the most because I tend to build with it. I build sheds, I build all kinds of stuff, little deck projects and stuff of that nature. If you cut like I do, you'll end up with that type of process. If you don't cut dimensional lumber, you may end up cutting slab wood. This is an example of slab wood. So when you put the log up on the sawmill, you end up just cutting it like a flat saw and you end up with two sides on the log or two sides on the piece of wood, which has bark on it. I'll call this a piece of slab wood. So that's another way of doing your sawing. So you've got your lumber made or your slab wood made. Let's come back to the sawmill here. What are you gonna be doing with this sawmill to keep it operational? Well, the truth is you're not doing a heck of a lot once you get it set up the first time. When I say set up, I'm talking about put into a position where it's nice and flat. It's also level. If it's not level, what can happen is because the saw head rolls freely, if this platform here is not level, the sawmill will want to roll off the end either way. So once the platform is set up nice and flat and level, then it becomes a matter of just making sure your blade sharp. And then inside here, as you guys have seen in previous videos, maybe we'll take a quick look here. You've just got some belts you got to keep an eye on. But in my experience, you're not spending a heck of a lot of time with these belts. You may change them periodically, but I'm not talking very frequently. So you've got some belts here. And for those of you who are asking, yes, it's supposed to be loose. You've got that belt there. And if we make our way to the other side, if you're running this sawmill here, you'll also have this belt here, the drive belt. So those are the only basic things at this end you're dealing with. The blade, you'll end up, you'll end up replacing that with a sharp blade potentially every few hours, depending on how much you're cutting. Uh, the other thing is you may end up replacing, see these guide blocks, it's a dark color there. There's a guide block there, there, under there, and there. You may end up replacing that, but very infrequently. And the only other thing is you're gonna end up having to make sure there's fuel in this engine, oil in the engine, flip, uh, switch the uh, oil periodically, the air filter here, making sure that's clean, but that's just a standard small engine stuff. And then aside from that, you'll probably put a little bit of uh, lubrication here on the cables. 
And I'm just looking here, the other thing, you'll keep your lubrication tank filled, or in my case, you'll uh, have to switch out the fluid from water to antifreeze or whatever you're using in the winter. But besides that, that is the basic process. And oh yeah, you may end up just putting some lubrication here on both sides on the upright pieces. And what that's gonna do is allow the saw head to move up and down nice and easy. But besides that, once you get that sawmill set up, there's not a lot of time you're gonna be spending sort of going back over it with a fine tooth comb. You're gonna be doing that stuff right off the start. Lots of details, I'm sure, in all the manufacturer's manuals. If you take your time, you get advice from the manufacturer and other people who saw, I'm sure you'll be just fine. As I said before, I was not born knowing how to run a sawmill, nor was anyone else. And so if you take your time, you read through things, you understand what's going on, and if not, you ask, there is no reason everyone out there can't operate a sawmill just like I do. So the next time you are told you cannot be a sawyer because you don't know enough about sawmills, you tell those people, get back to sawing, and you go and do the same yourself. Anyways, let's uh, get these logs up here. We'll make some lumber as I like to do, and we'll see how today turns out. I can tell you, one thing is for certain, it's a beautiful thing out here. Guys, welcome back. Just as the saw is warming up, I get this question an awful lot in which people ask me, how do you know uh, what size lumber you're gonna get out of what log? But what I can tell you is experience will teach you what each log looks like it can produce. So in this case, this log is real small. Like at this end, this is like five and a half inches and that end is probably about six inches. Uh, based on the lumber that I cut, and I often cut two by fours, two by sixes, as I said, uh, periodically one by material. But in this case, I would look down that log, it's relatively straight, and I would say to myself, okay, the biggest cant, which is a log without four sides on it, the biggest square cant that I can get out of that is what I'm gonna cut. And so in this case, I look at this and I think I can get a four by four out of that. And if I cut a four by four out of that, that will allow me to cut two pieces of two by four, if it's true dimension, true two inches by four inches. If I wanted to cut one and a half inch wide, by four inches, which I've been cutting a lot lately, then obviously I would need to make uh, something that's just around three inches wide by four inches. But I would probably start by making that into a cant, about a four by four, and then go from there. Check this out, guys. I use these lasers quite a bit. You guys see down there? So what those lasers allow me to do is to visualize where the blade is gonna make a cut. Now I know I wanna make a four by four out of that. And so I wanna give a little bit for waste on the top, a little bit for waste on the bottom. Let's assume that log was six inches in diameter. That means I'm gonna cut one inch off the top, leaving one inch on the bottom to also cut off. Six inches, take away one, take away one more, leaves me at four inches. So in this case, I'm just looking here. And I probably want to take a little more off. And so I'm gonna use my power head here. So probably what I'm gonna do, I'm probably gonna cut right there. I'm gonna make a cut at five inches, then I'll flip that log over and I'll make my finish cut at four inches. That'll leave me a four inch piece. Then I'll flip it on edge and make the two side cuts.
so as I'm cutting there, you guys would notice I didn't have any lubrication coming out. These logs are frozen, and so because they're frozen, that creates very little resistance, very little friction. It also creates very little heat on the blade. If it was going to be a nice dry log, even though it's winter, I would end up putting washer fluid in my, in my tank here, my lubrication tank. Right now, there's nothing in it, so it's no lubrication. Uh, another thing that you may have noticed was on that first cut, I sort of listen to the engine a, quite a bit. I listen to the engine so that I can tell how hard it's working to make the cut. If that's a sharp blade, that engine should not be working very hard, especially because that log's like very, very small and it's also a fairly, uh, fairly light piece of wood. It's not a dense hardwood, it's a piece of balsam fir. So I listen to that engine and I also feel for resistance. If there's resistance when I'm cutting, that's an indicator to me that something's wrong and nine times out of 10, the blade needs to be sharpened. But things went well there. We'll uh, rotate the blade, excuse me, rotate the uh, log over and we'll make our final cut. Those of you guys who don't saw or maybe you've sawn and haven't seen this before uh, sometimes logs have built up tension in them that one that one right there is a prime example so i cut that last edge off and see what happened to the uh, the tension in the log it released now i have a feeling if i were to cut real thin material out of that last chunk of lumber down there it would probably bow <laughs> excuse me and so that's good indication that if i was going to cut thin material maybe i should consider alternatives in this case, I'm just gonna make this into uh, two two by fours, or in actuality, I've decided it's gonna be inch and a half thick by four inches wide. So we'll get that flipped down and we'll do that.
So I'm just about to cut this next log here, and this log's a little bit bigger than the uh, last few, thankfully. It's not much bigger though. I look at this log and I say to myself, well, it's all right. It's certainly gonna get a bigger piece of lumber than a two by four. And so I go up to the next size that I often need. That's a two by six. And then I look and see, can I get a two by six out of this? Absolutely. So I look at the end here and I think to myself, what type of, uh, or what size of can't can I get out of that? And I'm thinking I could probably get, I could probably get at least two two by sixes out of it and one two by four. And so I'm gonna try to make a cut so that I'm left with a six inch uh, high can. That's gonna be what my goal is. So I'm gonna make a cut here, probably gonna cut a little bit higher than six inches, maybe to seven inches. I'll flip the log completely over, then I'll make a final cut at six inches. Then I'll be left with a six inch piece to get my two by sixes, and then I'll flip it on its sides to get the maximum width possible. You'll also notice this log here's got a taper. Because it's got a taper, I try to lift the small end up just a little bit. And there are tow boards out there. I think Woodland Mills sells one, but you, I'm just using this, uh, this piece of wood here for now. So let's give her a go.
Okay, guys, I think that is just about going to do it for me here today. That was a ton of fun being out here. I enjoy being out amongst the trees and the snow and the sleet and everything else. I just don't like being out here amongst the bugs. So thankfully, they are definitely not in season, nor do they look like they will be for some time. The name of the game today was to fill up the lumber shed or at least start getting it filled up. And that's what we did. We added a few pieces of lumber, some 2x4, some 2x6. You guys saw me stack it up there. I sticker it. I put spaces not only uh, between the rows, but I also put spacing between the boards. And so as this dries, it'll uh, become very useful for me in the future. I plan on filling up this shed, then we'll head over to that shed. And eventually we'll have a huge pile of lumber and I'm gonna use that to build some future projects. So hopefully you guys come back and check that out. Anyways, I can tell you one thing. I used to think that I would get sick of sawing one day but it is still as fun today as it was the very first time that I came out and started using this sawmill. And so that might be an indicator that I'm a sawyer for life. And if you guys are interested at all in doing something like this, I would definitely encourage you guys to get out and try it. And at the very least, don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. There's lots of opportunities for everyone to uh, get out and make some dust and some beautiful lumber just as I do. So guys, in the meantime, take care, be well. Make sure if you haven't done so already, please give her the old like roo subscribe. Helps my videos get out there to find folks like yourself. And guys, I'll see you next time.